green crabs took over New England, probably after hitching a ride on trading ships. The U.S. government originally imported carp from Asia to eat algae. Oh, that was huge. And pythons that now slither around the Florida Everglades are the offspring of exotic pets that escaped. Every year, invasive species cause up to $1.4 trillion worth of damage in places they weren't meant to live. It's equal to 5% of the global economy. They can ruin crops, kill native animals, and make people sick. So some people have declared war against these pests. And they're learning how to make a buck from the invaders they hunt. You know that you're helping the Everglades when you are taking these animals out. We checked out companies around the world cashing in on invasive species. Oh, him, I don't. I have no idea what part. Got him. Go. Oh, nice. Oh, damn. I thought he was gone. That's early. Catching wild Burmese pythons takes serious skills. Right there, right there. You see it? Only 100 people are licensed to capture these snakes in Florida, where the invasive pest has decimated local wildlife. It's not easy once you catch crawling up this levee with a python. It's still fighting. You feel it. They get tighter and tighter. And sometimes I've almost felt like it could just pop my kneecap. They aren't poisonous, but they have super strong bodies that they use to squeeze and kill their prey, which could be as large as an alligator. The only way to try to stop the invasive species from taking over is by catching them one by one. So who are the fearless python hunters making the most out of this risky business? Why is python removal so urgent for Florida? And how did they get here in the first place? Hey, let go, let go, let go her tail. Wrap the rope around her. Wrap the rope. Here. Amy Siwi has caught over 400 pythons since she began hunting in 2019. When you see that python, it's adrenaline through the roof. Do it here. Somebody grab the tail and I can grab the head. You gotta pull this tight. Hurry up. Okay. Gotta got pull it, it tight. Got it, got it, got it. Where is she? Where is she? You have got the it. rope around it? I got a rope. Or, yeah, it's not tight. Sometimes it's an easy grab, sometimes it's a battle. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> here, bring that up on this camera here. Hell yeah. You, know, you just never know what you're gonna get, so it keeps it very exciting. She taught herself how to skin the animals and often does it at home. She uses pool salt to preserve it until she can send it to a tannery. We have to put it on thick enough so it'll uh, get in all of the little crevices. And that is a snake roll. In 2019, she developed her own line of python leather turning the skin into bracelets and wristbands. I hate that we have to kill them. That is the worst part of this job, but we do. There's no other choice. So I've kind of made it my mission to figure out how to use as much of the python as possible so they don't go to waste. Back in the 1980s, these snakes were sold as exotic pets. They were imported from Southeast Asia and newspaper ads priced them at a few hundred dollars. Then, in 1992, dozens of Burmese pythons escaped a breeding facility when Hurricane Andrew hit. And their spread has been nearly impossible to control because they have no real predators here in the Florida Everglades, one of the largest wetlands on the planet. The biggest one ever found in Florida was 215 pounds, 18 feet long, and was ready to lay 122 eggs. The snakes swallow their prey whole. And while they rarely attack humans, they're killing all kinds of native animals, from small birds to large alligators. In 2012, populations of foxes and marsh and cottontail rabbits effectively disappeared because of pythons. We are finding those animals in their stomachs, including some endangered species and federally threatened species, such as the endangered Key Largo wood rat and the federally threatened wood stork. Now, licensed contractors like Peggy and Beth remove about 5,000 pythons a year from the Everglades. 
they start hunting after sunset because that's when snakes are out searching for prey. Good evening, this is Beth Kohler calling. I'm beginning a python survey in Francis S. Taylor. Only licensed python hunters and government officials are allowed to drive through these restricted levees. There's virtually no cell service once they enter. So they use a satellite radio. And if a serious injury were to happen, they would need to be airlifted out. Spotting a python is hard, even with that flashlight. I'll see a python and it's moving and we'll get in that area and you're looking around and you might as well step on it before you see it. I mean, it's amazing how well they can camouflage themselves into this. Still, they say this is easy compared to their full-time job grooming dogs. We've been in business together for 35 years now, and um, it's a lot of work. That job is hard work. It, it makes this look like a cakewalk. <laughs> but it takes patience. Often they can hunt all night and still leave empty-handed. It's like regular life, hours and hours of boredom and then minutes of pure adrenaline. <laughs> Let's go get some pythons. like an opalescent sheen, like a water bottle or a piece of glass. The, the light will catch the, the, the shine of the, the python. You're scanning the environment for other dangers. You know, there might be an alligator in the water nearby. There might be a cottonmouth nearby. We followed them on three hunts before they finally spotted a python. Right there, right there. You see it? Yeah. Then it's all hands on deck. Got it. They keep the snakes on the ground. Lifting it in the air would scare it. Got it. It's a battle, you've got to wear it out, you know, and get it calmed down so you can get it in the bag. So you're sweating, it's very hot. Even the smallest python, you will be shocked at the strength. They're nothing but muscle. Keep going, keep it tight. Florida's Fish and Wildlife Agency pays hunters by the hour and by how long a snake is. All right, almost nine footer. Is it $50 for the first four feet and then an additional $25 for each foot beyond four feet. So like a five foot snake is $75. But they don't kill the snakes in the wild. The state decides whether they'll euthanize the animal later or if it will be used for research. They double bag it and put it inside a lockbox. All right, lock, lock her up. I grew up down here, so I definitely can see the, the, the impact these pythons have had on the environment. Peggy and Beth started hunting five years ago after they participated in the Florida Python Challenge in 2016. That's a 10-day event that anyone can enter and get a cash prize for catching a snake. Animal rights groups like PETA have criticized it because they say it allows inexperienced people to go barging about in forests and swamps on a macho mission to kill. But the FWC does require participants to take an online course before the hunt. She's backing up trying to figure out, can I get away from her? And biologists like Michaela Spencer say, euthanizing the snakes is the only way to control the problem. We always have people asking, have you thought about rehoming them? Could we send them back to their native country? Well, you know, remember, these animals are established in a whole different ecosystem. They could have different diseases and things like that. So we really can't ship them anywhere else. Her not striking is a good sign that she's tiring out. Oh, we got her. She works for the FWC and showed us how hunters can capture the snakes safely. The second I had her pinned right behind that head, I reached in and grabbed. If she goes around my leg, it can be a good example of like why I give her a leg and not my arms. She's actually staying relatively calm after capturing her, probably because that back and forth tired her out. <laughs> but I've got my leg here. I'm not sitting on her, just to be clear. I don't put any weight on a snake, and I tell people don't ever sit on them, don't put any weight. Sometimes they'll just put themselves in the bag once you start to feed them in there. There we go. 
go. And then a little bit more of a coil. All right, we'll just feed her in there. Okay. So she goes in here, I'm gonna stick that top on. Since the snakes need to be eradicated, some python hunters are doing what they can to preserve the legacy. They're amazing creatures. They're beautiful. It's not their fault they're here. They're just doing what pythons do. Amy says her leather line is her own way of honoring the reptiles. This is a skin that has some battle wounds on it, some scars on it from the python being in the wild. You know, it they get bitten by alligators, they get clawed by bears, they get in fights with themselves, with each other. The cool thing about this is that if, if you get a product that is made out of, with this scar in it, it is the only one like it in the world, and this is from the Everglades. You know that you're helping the Everglades when you are taking these animals out. Well, I just try to remind myself that for the greater good, a lot of natives are gonna live. I can remove one python and give dozens of rabbits a chance at a good life. Pythons aren't the only thing threatening Florida. The mass of seaweed twice the width of the United States is headed for the state's coastline this summer. It's called sargassum. It's an eyesore and a human health hazard. When it decomposes, sargassum releases ammonia and hydrogen sulfide gas, which can cause respiratory problems. Mexico's been dealing with this weed for decades, but experts say the problem has worsened in recent years, likely due to nitrogen from agricultural waste and deforestation. Companies there have figured out how to turn the weed into paper, bricks, and even shoes. Veo a mi empresa futuro vendiendo mundialmente, teniendo una planta. O sea, apenas estamos empezando y ya estamos consumiendo casi 200 kilos en una semana. To make paper, workers blend seaweed into a paste. They use a wooden frame to shape and mold it and hang the final product to dry. Sargassum affects the coasts, but invasive plants are a problem in freshwater too. In Cambodia, one company weaves a local menace into baskets and bags. This invasive weed is choking lakes and rivers around the world. Water hyacinths now clog waterways in over 50 countries, including Tan Le Sap, the largest freshwater lake in Southeast Asia. The people there cannot travel easily when it grows super thick, and uh, also the living things under the water die. So far, exterminating the plant has proven impossible for the 1.5 million people who live here. Now, locals are removing the pest with their bare hands and giving new life to the dry stems. We went to Cambodia to see how local women are making fashionable bags from worldwide waste. Water hyacinth is native to the Amazon, but over the past century, humans helped it spread to places it never should have been. It's been transported all over the world because it's beautiful. It's an ornamental plant species. Dr. Kit McGowan is an ecologist who studies invasive plants. It's native to the upper reaches of the Amazon basin. Most of the transport occurred during the early 20th century. In the Amazon, weevils and moths keep the hyacinths in check. But without predators, the plants can double in size every two weeks. They block out light and oxygen and kill all kinds of other species. That's a big problem for Tonle Sap's floating villages. Tonle Sap is the heart of Cambodia. This is a unique ecosystem, and the villages around there have a, a rather unique lifestyle. The hyacinths create so much waste that they're harming stocks of staple foods, and they make it harder to get around. Many times we got stuck for a few hours in the middle of the water hyacinth lake. Hao Soon Sra runs Rokok, a company that hires women to remove the weeds by hand and then weave the stems into baskets, rugs, and other handicrafts. She says she wanted to help local women earn a living while dealing with the plant that makes their way of life more difficult. Many women, they still live in the circle of grown up and get married in the young age. I want them to be employed and to get some training. They can bundle as many as 200 hyacinth stalks at a time. They bring them back onto shore to dry in the sun for up to two weeks. Then they wash them. 
lần tập phong này mà bạn bấm phong đôi chị này mốt đôi chị vậy bấm đôi chị chở lộ bò The women lay the stems out on top of this wooden platform and steam the plants over charcoal to kill bacteria and get the right color. After the steaming, our weavers would select the size of water hyacinth stem. They use small stems for coasters and medium ones for bags and baskets. The largest stems will become rugs. Our weaving is based on our traditional weaving. You can see from our weaving style and also the fabric that we use. This one we made for a, one of the apartment in Siem Reap. One rug can take three women over a month to weave. But at Rokok, women can make up to $300 for a finished product, more than what the average Cambodian earns in a month. There are millions of people around the world struggling with water hyacinths, and they've found all kinds of solutions. In Bangladesh, locals farm on top of mats made from the invasive plant. Mechanical harvesters on Lake Victoria in Kenya keep the plants in check, but they're expensive to operate. Local entrepreneurs there have found success helping the weeds break down into biogas for cooking, and compost for growing crops. In Nigeria, a startup similar to Rokok also employs women to make handicrafts. One thing we have to remember about all of these uses is they're, they're probably not sustainable, so they're only short-term solutions to the problem of this invasive species. Because if we create an industry using this species, then we're going to create a demand for this species. Back in the States, the green crab is called the cockroach of the sea. They've been ravaging marine ecosystems everywhere, from New England to the Pacific Northwest since at least the 1930s. And some locals are trying to convince people to eat, then drink them. Like the distiller in New Hampshire, who makes crab whiskey. Will Robinson uses 80 pounds of green crab to make just one batch. It has the funk of the crab, but the spice prevents that from being harsh. And chefs in New England are adding the invasive species to the menu. I'm not going to make a crab ice cream yet, but I may go that, that far. <laughs> Will's making his fourth batch of Crab Trapper. For each one, he buys roughly a thousand live crabs from a harvester on the New Hampshire coast. But these guys, uh, I don't work with them without gloves. Will's been an environmentalist his whole life and loves pushing the boundaries of what can be added to whiskey. Part of this, why it's made a big story, is because of the ick factor in using crab in a spirit. But I don't think I've had anybody taste it who was put off by the flavor at all. He slowly simmers them for 20 minutes, so the aromas don't cook off. Then he mixes the crab-flavored stock with the distillery's house-made spirit in a vacuum still that stays at a low temperature. A lot of the flavor molecules and, and aroma molecules are very delicate, so those would break down if we were to boil them in a, in a regular still. Crab flavor alone isn't very appetizing, so he adds a blend of eight different spices. Coriander, mustard seed, dill seed, fresh bay leaf, paprika, allspice, clove, and cinnamon. That's all combined with the distillery's base bourbon to form the final product. I didn't drink while I was driving, but I kept a small vial in my vehicle so that when I would pull up at a stoplight, I could smell it and be like, oh yeah, no, this definitely works. Will hopes his concoction will inspire others to get creative with green crabs. They don't have a whole lot of meat. However, if we could create a soft shell crab market for them, it would be huge because they have fantastic flavor. And that's exactly what harvesters like Mike Macy are trying to do by catching and selling as many as he can. Let's see how we do today. That's a good start. Mike used to teach marine science at a local high school. Now he catches green crabs for a living, thanks to fisheries specialist Gabby Brought, who came to speak to his class about green crabs. We just talked a lot about the abundance of the resource and the quality of the product, and it just got to the point where I said, someone's got to give this a try. Mike had been following the species for years, <laughs> but this is the first season he's harvesting them commercially. He's one of the few making a tiny dent in a huge population. So how many of them are there? As many stars as there are in the sky. <laughs> the exact number, I can't tell you. Certainly enough to threaten Maine's $890 million fishing industry. 
Back in the 1800s, these stowaways probably made their way to the U.S. on trading ships coming from Europe. But no one really noticed until the 1930s, when fishermen saw that green crabs were eating all the shellfish. Females can lay eggs up to twice a year and produce about 185,000 eggs at a time. And they have no predators. A pretty decent sized green crab can eat up to 40 mussels a day or 40 soft shell clams a day. And they can dig up to eight inches. From 1948 to 1958, soft shell clam production in Maine fell by over 80% as green crabs became more and more rampant. If you have too many of them, it's not just your seafood that goes away. It's a lot of your biodiversity and our marsh habitats. Like eelgrass meadows that green crabs damage when they burrow for shelter and dig for prey. Eelgrass is a plant that can help stabilize some sediment in the bottom of estuaries. But more than that, it's a fabulous nursery habitat for commercially important species. New England's harsh winters used to keep crab numbers down. But now scientists say warming waters due to climate change are giving them a chance to thrive. While there haven't been any major recent studies, it's clear they're still wreaking havoc everywhere from New England to Washington. In 2021, the Lummi Nation found more than 70,000 crabs in one 750-acre saltwater pond over just a few months. It was roughly 30 times what they'd caught just a year earlier. While there are national strategies in place to tackle other invasive species like Asian carp, there isn't one for green crabs. But environmentalists and chefs are pushing hard to create a market for harvesting and cooking them. And it's starting to catch on. Americans don't have a really broad palette <laughs> for seafood. So introducing a good but new concept in terms of a culinary ingredient takes a little bit of coaxing. In places like Venice, soft shell green crabs or moeke are a delicacy. Gabby says the challenge in the U.S. is getting people to understand that invasive doesn't mean inedible. The problem is they're tough shells. So the key is to catch them during the tiny window just before they shed their hard shell and grow a new one. They're only going to be soft for, I mean, really paper thin soft for maybe 12 hours. Mike has 20 traps throughout this estuary, baited with two small herrings each. Sometimes the uh, seagulls pull the bait bags out. One crate alone can catch 40 pounds of green crab overnight. That's equivalent to about 400 crabs or enough for a couple hundred bottles of crab whiskey. When they come up in the traps, they are all going to be hard shells or very recently molted crabs that are of really no use to us except to be sold to the bait market. Those only go for about five cents each, roughly 50 times less than what a restaurant-worthy crab would bring in. That's a freshly molted male, freshly molted male, and those are all missed opportunities from this spring. But Mike has a plan. Their molting season only lasts about two months. Males typically molt from May to July, while females molt between August and early October. They put the ones with the best chance of molting soon into crab condos. This one on top, being the much larger one, is the molted crab and a soft shell. And what's left behind is its discarded carapace. This one's looking like a pretty good product. It molted with all its legs and claws. You can see it's kind of fresh and shiny on the bottom. Others that won't molt for another two to three weeks are stored in crates. Trapping is still happening at a pretty small scale, but it could potentially work. Between 2010 and 2012, nearly one million crabs were removed from an estuary in Nova Scotia. Eelgrass habitats and softshell clams slowly made a comeback. Just south in the coastal waters of Maine, the goal is the same. There's no way that we'll ever be able to eradicate this species. The idea is just to bring the population down to a dull roar. And what better way to do that than by convincing people to eat them? Even though green crabs are one of the most common crab species here in New England, it's pretty hard to find them on menus and you're not gonna be able to go up to any old fish market and find a green crab. Mary Parks founded greencrab.org in 2017 to showcase recipes that might encourage people to give them a try. And remember how crabs lay 185,000 eggs at a time? Turns out they're pretty tasty if you cook them right. You're just gonna take your nail and pop off this back of the carapace. Inside here might not look super appetizing to some, but if you scoop with a spoon towards the back of the shell, 
what you'll reveal is this beautiful, bright orange row. Mary sautés the row for a few minutes with olive oil, pepper, and white wine. Then she combines it with sweet corn and garnishes the dish with dill, basil, one shallot, and chili oil. She often buys the crabs online in frozen three pound packs from Wolf's Fish. 120 pounds of green crabs are delivered to the warehouse weekly. The goal is to get these critters out of the water and onto plates. Everyone in the seafood industry is concerned about green crabs and there's a wonderful opportunity to use that abundance and make something delicious. At Alcove in Boston, the furlong bisque named after the late harvester Mike Furlong has been on the menu for about five years. I got a small amount of them and I made the bisque and it just knocked me out. My customers loved it. Saute them a little bit. And then, and this is the most important part, is you want to just sort of break them open a little bit. That's how the dish gets its deep flavor. So you can make a bisque with blue crab or lobster, but green crabs actually have exponentially more that dark, roasty ocean flavor you really want. Once it's cooked, the soup is blended, pureed, and strained. This is the finished bisque hot. See it nice and thick and creamy looking but there's no cream in it, no dairy. That is until it's garnished with a scoop of mascarpone. And then uh, one of my favorite herbs to use for this is chervil. It's one of the uh, fien herbs, they call it, and that's it. So far, this is his only green crab-inspired dish, but he doesn't want to stop there. They're an invasive species and they're delicious, which is a twofer. Crabs have long been a culinary staple, but what about lionfish? They may be venomous, but that doesn't mean you can't eat them. With the right preparation, they're pretty tasty too. Norman's Lionfish sold the spiny creatures until it closed down. I was opening up a Caribbean restaurant in the Lower East Side in New York City, and we wanted to have a, a hook, no pun intended, and we wanted to sell an invasive fish. Lionfish have become the poster child for invasive species in North America. They're beautiful, but really shouldn't be hanging out in certain parts of the ocean. These fish pose a very real threat to marine ecosystems. A single lionfish could mean 79% fewer native species in an area. Lionfish are primarily invading the Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean. And outside their Indo-Pacific home, they have very few predators. They'll eat anything. So that's, that's one issue that you know, we have is, if you're looking at some of these reefs, they're, they're wiping them out. And it's just lionfish on the reefs now. Ryan Chadwick founded a lionfish supply company to stock his own restaurants. We ended up sourcing lionfish ourselves in the Bahamas, flying down on the weekends, spearing the fish and bringing it back up in coolers. The tricky thing about lionfish is that you have to spear them one at a time. They don't live in schools, won't bite a hook, and traps and nets can catch more than just lionfish. Add on the venomous spines and you've got yourself an animal fishermen are reluctant to hunt. So how do you make the risk worthwhile? You pay them. We could pay a little bit more than they would say, go out for a grouper or snapper. That makes us happy, because they'll, they'll go after this fish more than they will for the other fish. And there's no season on lionfish. So there's no tag limits. There's, you know, it's open season everywhere. So you're talking about year-round income for some of these fishermen, which is great. But paying more for the fishermen means paying more for the fish. The price for lionfish has gone up, and we understand that, and I think people are willing to pay a little bit more for a fish they know is, is potentially saved our, our fragile ecosystem. But even Chadwick is only cautiously optimistic at most about the effect efforts like his will have. I think it's population control. I don't think it's eradication. I really don't. I hope it is, but I don't think so. I think it's worth it for us because we know the end result, if we don't do something, uh, this fish will consume every single fish in the Atlantic in a matter of time. In some parts of Africa, locals are also cooking up invasives, but not to eat. In Ethiopia, workers in a refugee camp turn a species of mesquite into biofuel. And in Senegal, others make bio-coal from an invasive weed called taifa. <laughs> But now it's being used to cook, build homes, and create economic opportunities here in Senegal, all in a sustainable way. Taifa became an international problem 
after the construction of two dams between Senegal and Mauritania in the mid-80s. The dams cut off the flow of water and created ideal conditions for the weed to grow. For years, both governments tried and failed to find an effective way to eliminate it. Now, locals are trying on their own, and with their bare hands, as part of a project led by the French NGO GRET. The biocoal is made by burning taifa in these outdoor kilns for six hours at a time. The charred reeds are mixed with water and rice husks. A machine shapes it into briquettes, which are then laid out to dry for three to four days. Taifa briquettes ignite faster and burn longer than wood. In rural Senegal, more than 80% of the population relies on wood for cooking and heating. The pollutants released by wood burning can harm your heart and your lungs. Taifa coal, on the other hand, produces much less smoke. And the plant can be used for more than just burning. Taifa can also be mixed with clay to make bricks for construction. Many of the people participating in the GRET project are women. Parce que, comme par exemple, avant ce métier, on était les femmes des foyers. On était, on va au champ, période de champ, ça ne dure pas peut-être un mois ou un mois, quelques jours, et on reste à la foyer. On ne fait rien d'autre. Mais avec l'aide du Tifa et la transformation du bio charbon, on peut soutenir nos maris dans nos maisons, dans nos foyers, sur l'aide des enfants, sur l'éducation des enfants, et même sur la cuisine. Every month, participants turn nearly 30,000 pounds of taifa into biocoal. Although this process creates new sources of revenue, the weed is still endangering valuable farmland. Cutting the weed is labor-intensive, and transportation costs are high. It can also be difficult to find buyers. But NGOs and locals are working to find ways to minimize costs and increase efficiency. Hi, this is Will Story from the World Wide Waste team. We want to bring you more stories that take a look at garbage and the creative ways people deal with it. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. We also read all the comments. If you have an idea for a video you'd like to see, let us know.